Everybody's one link. Hey, everybody. It's uh, Jonas Lamas here with uh, Tezos Community. And uh, we're, we're, we're trying a slightly a new format here today. We've got an open forum discussion with two of the to the uh, hottest guys uh, in the Tezos sphere these days. We've got Joven and we've got Mike on on board. And we're going to just uh, throw out some ideas, talk about what's going on in the world of Tezos and the broader world of uh, cryptocurrency. And uh, we're hoping you all enjoy this conversation. So let me uh, let me welcome both you guys. Say hi to everybody. What's going on in your world today? Oh, okay. Go well, hi, this is, uh, this is Mike from uh, My Crypto Delegate. Just uh, here chatting about Tezos as usual. Uh, Jovan? Yeah, Jovan, guys. Uh, everybody knows me. Reddit, uh, Jovi1945 on Twitter at JV Dola or jo Jovi JV Dola. Yeah, and we're here to talk about some Tezos. Cool, guys. Well, uh, glad to have you hanging hanging out here today. The, um, the, the first topic I wanted to throw out to everybody and talk about is what is going on with the foundation? We've uh, we we as, as Javon did in his uh, his wrap up last week, he uh, he got online and talked about the the crazy tweets from Johan that happened during the uh, uh, the crypto conference in Switzerland. And uh, one, one of those one of those tweets was a promise that more information would be forthcoming this week. Uh, here it is uh, Saturday, more than a week later, and no information's forthcoming. You guys have any idea what's going on over there? Yeah, I have no clue. I read those things, and that's the most communication that's come from him in six months are those tweets alone. So uh, it'll be interesting if he comes out with anything more, but I'm not all that hopeful that uh, it'll be anything really meaningful at this point. Well, you know, I, I was reading up on uh, Swiss Foundation code and things like that. Um, and this is, you know, this is this is straight from and we can we should put uh, the, the source for this uh, in the video, but he's not required to communicate under Swiss law as the president of a foundation, he's his own legal entity in a way, and he doesn't really have to um, communicate, uh, but he does have to f fulfill the foundation's purpose. And according to, you know, everything that I've read, the only purpose of the Tezos Foundation is to promote the uh, protocol financially and things like that, which he hasn't done. So yeah, totally. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how the, uh, how the Swiss authorities are gonna come down on this. They don't really like to get involved unless they absolutely have to. And that's why, you know, this guy is able to get away with this. And he made a comment, remember, he says, you know, and he was really talking about Americans uh, for the most part, because we're the ones bitching and complaining. We we don't understand the difference between a trust and a foundation. So then I went and looked up Swiss foundations under Swiss law today. And so he most definitely doesn't, he's not required to uh, reach out and, and send text messages. So the fact that he did all that is odd. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah I think, well, I think I, just... I'll say that just in the uh, process of doing his actual job to promote the Tezos ecosystem, he, he needs to reach out to at least a handful of people, yeah. uh, pay his bills, uh, foster you know a, a strong a community, and also uh, help the code development. And from what I've seen, there hasn't been any of that in literally seven months now. Uh, so right. you're right; he doesn't have to communicate with the uh, with the community, but he needs to communicate with people who are trying to develop a platform. And I, I haven't seen that. I can I can personally attest to that, you know, as the guy who uh, who got him to uh, agree to sponsor our first Tezos meetup uh, way back in early August last August. Uh, last year. Yeah, I put my credit card down on that uh, event, and uh, you know, he said he would reimburse me, and I haven't ha have yet gotten a reimbursement from the foundation. So, um, that, but it, that money good, it was a good event. I enjoyed it. That money would have been nice to uh, to have been put in Ethereum or something like that. Uh, hey, so did you, instead did, you of also, there. Uh, did, did the money also come from the Tezos Foundation for the Urbana meetup? Like literally, uh, my buddy put that together and he didn't come out. Of, I don't think he, if he did come out of his pocket, it was supposed to be reimbursed as well. But like there was free food. The Tezos bag showed up. The stickers, my cryptodelegate.com stickers. So I'm not really sure how that all flowed in. I, I mean, I sent those to you guys, uh, okay. you know, from, from here, but um, I have not heard of any sort of uh, foundation contribution to the meetups. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know if he's uh, got, got Johan to, uh, to agree to reimburse the bags and the food and all that kind of stuff as well. But, but as uh, it seems pretty clear from, 
from the folks who uh, were have supposed to be paid by their salary to the folks who have supposed to been reimbursed. It really, no money has been flowing out of the foundation uh, for the last several months, at least. Um, most one importantly, of the, to actually pay for the code. I mean, that's really the most important right, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, bill paying is to pay for the actual code development, which is what we're all, you know, waiting for, so the system can launch. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, sure. What b before we move off of the foundation, one of the one of the key things for everybody to keep an eye on is what happens between now and the end of the month. You know, at the end of uh, uh, January. Uh, the foundation is under the gun to appoint a uh, a replacement board member for uh, for Guido, who who stepped away back in December, I think. Um, and the, it, the the understanding I have is that the uh, foundation authority uh, has uh, ha is pushing the current found foundation board members to make that appointment happen. Uh, I think it'll be really interesting to see if they're able to come to consensus and. And get somebody put into that in, into into that seat, so that you know theoretically, once they have a functioning board, um, <clears throat> they may be able to unstick themselves and uh, and get back on track. But I'm I'm not optimistic about that happening. Yeah, if I could just chime in real quick. Uh, so according to Swiss according to Swiss Law Foundation, um, the purpose a, a purpose of a foundation has to be known to authorities before they agree before they. Um, approve that a foundation is even created. And so for the Tezos Foundation to be even operating, they have a, the Swiss government ha, um, knows the purpose of that foundation. And the purpose of that found of the Tezos Foundation is literally to fund the Tezos project and all of its ecosystems and things like that. So to change a purpose's foundation is not overnight, right? So if Johan wanted to change the purpose of the foundation, meaning take the money and do whatever he kind of wants with it. That is a timely process. Uh, it, it can take years, right? And in the meantime, the the foundation's purpose is still to fund the project. And so this has to get going according to Swiss law. And so, the, you know, eventually yeah, totally. this, this is going to happen. Like the money is going to flow towards Tezos. I don't think that's not, he's not going to disappear with the, a billion dollars. No, he can't. He can't disappear with it, and that's that's one of the things we should also highlight is that uh, just because the funds aren't necessarily flowing right now, doesn't mean that they're not safe. Right. Yeah, they're, they're probably in one of the safest places in the entire world, uh, <laughs> in Switzerland. So they're not going anywhere. It's just that we want them to actually be spent on right. the, the the project development. So the the, the funds are safe. This is the point. Correct. Yeah, totally. And and you know the uh, the other forcing factor in all of this. Uh, that it makes a kind of a ticking time bomb out there is the fact that there are a number of uh, class action lawsuits that are uh, that are going through, you know, uh, the, the first legal motions um, against the foundation. And uh, I know that on on Twitter this week, one of uh, one of the lawyers out there um, did a, kind of a brief analysis of publicly filed documents on on those lawsuits. Sounds like. Um, uh, the the foundations and the Brightmans have some fairly competent attorneys uh, in preventing early kind of uh, discovery, if you will. But I, I uh, at least this lawyer's uh, thesis was that you know discovery could happen by April, and um, that's kind of a major forcing function to try and get the uh, chain live by that point in time as well. Hmm. I know that I read an article. McDonald is a plaintiff. Uh, 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 the last name is McDonald. He he's one of the uh, suing parties, and I believe a federal judge um, ruled in on a separate occasion to not freeze the funds in the foundation. How he would even do that is kind of weird because Switzerland is its own jurisdiction, right? But anyways, um, and then secondly, the discovery was denied as well by a federal. I think judge. that might have been. I think that might have been the California case. Was that yes, the one that was that McDonald's. was done in California? Right, right, right. Yeah, that was a while ago. That the the judge kind of just said there's not a whole lot that they could do from there. Right, because uh, I think that was a good solid month ago. Uh, Tezos, what futures are what four dollars? I mean, they're well above the ICO price. Oh, um, yeah. And, and so, once they launch, to have to have a, lo a lawsuit, you have to show some sort of damage. Right. And right now, there's not a lot of liquidity because. The the futures are just in one location, and you can't use your ICO tokens. To, to liquidate. But once they actually launch, assuming that the price is higher than the ICO, I, I'm not a lawyer, but it seems like it'd be very difficult to prove damages when what you own is worth more than what you spent. Right. 
Right, exactly. And so that's that's one of the other you know strong pushes to finish the code, launch the platform, make good on the promise that Tezos made when the ICO was done. And that's that's coming up relatively soon. Right. Uh, I don't think anyone has a, a specific date, but it's within somewhat near eyesight mm -hmm. uh, at this point. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think we've we've started, you know, when you follow the the GitLab repository, when you listen to the comments that Arthur's making through his updates and through the uh, through the documentation that's being released, you can see that uh, there's um, there's a light at the end of the tunnel as far as getting uh, getting the main net launched. Uh, have you guys uh, got any insights into some of the recent announcements on the dev side that uh, that give you encouragement? Yeah, um, Mike, would you you want to go first, or? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I keep updated as much as I can, obviously, with with the code, uh, and there's always uh, new publications coming out, new uh, features. You know, uh, you know, he just obviously he launched uh, some some new documentation the other day, talking about some some details, which which I think you can go over. Yep. But yeah, I mean, there's obviously progress. If if anyone who's actually involved on a daily basis in the code itself, who's actually running a, a node and is uh, doing baking transactions, endorsements, and sending, you know, Monopoly Tezos back and forth to each other. There's a lot of progress. It, there is a real system uh, there. It's not, it's not a white paper, you know, just a white paper. It is a real platform that is currently up and running. For sure. Uh, that's being developed every single day. Yeah. Um, so I think that the combination of the fact that, that this is a real technology, it, it works. And the, the funds are secure. I, I would hope would put a lot of people's you know fear, uncertainty, and doubt aside. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I agree with that. Uh, you know, a while back, um, Arthur said that m most of the code has been largely written. You know, you got to remember, we got to we, we got to keep in mind that Tezos, the actual project in terms of the code, started years ago. So when we talk about going, when we talk about putting a lot of time and effort into blockchains and things like that. Tezos has been doing that for a long time. And so hard, you know, all of this, you know, it's, it's dealing with formal verification. It's trying to implement things that, um, and solve problems that plague other blockchains, not to mention the self amending process in Tezos kind of makes it forever young because according to the white paper, it can take on new innovations as they come. You know what I mean? And that's very important when you really think about the longevity of a, of a blockchain, especially from an investor standpoint, but, you know, with that being said, what Arthur also said is that, we, so they were working on the documentation. And so the latest uh, Git, 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 uh, GitLab uh, repository by him, it was authored just a day ago, Proof of Stake in Tezos, is part of that documentation process. And what we're talking about here is we're looking at block size, delegation, delegates, active and passive, uh, passive delegates, the roles. Uh, there's about 10,000 um, tokens per role. And we'll, we'll add a link for all this stuff so you guys can check this out. This is the actual mechanism. The cycles are discussed here. The security deposits are discussed here and documented along with banking rights, endorsements, inflation, the random seed protocol, and denunciations. So I'm not sure if these are the final permanent parameters, but this is the documentation for code. So forget what- Yeah, I think one of, one of the most interesting uh, things that Arthur said in his uh, weekly dev update about this topic yesterday uh, when he released it, was that the uh, if you think about the path to um, having a stable uh, mainnet launched, um, the remaining dev work can be divided into several different camps. One of them are uh, algorithmic uh, decisions that need to be made before you could consider launching your mainnet. And he called a lot of these things the, the, the constants, the, yeah. the, the mathematical models that need to be in, put in place and agreed to and, and uh, decided before, um, before you can turn the net live. And these are the topics that you were just talking about. He talked about economic constants, things like how much does it cost for gas in the system and how much, mm -hmm. how much uh, return does a, does a baker get and, and all those kinds of things. There's the economic constants and the, and the underlying algorithms that power those constants. And then there is the finishing edges on the, on the infrastructure and on the protocol. Right. Arthur's perspective from from the video that he launched, he said that with the economic constant models in place, we now can launch a mainnet with real live tokens on it without having 
a engineering risk of hard fork to roll back and fix those economic constants. Right, 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 exactly. Right, and so, uh, go ahead, Mike. I was gonna say though that there are economic constants for now for the system, but I think that over time, uh, everything can be adjusted. And I don't think that, you know, so you say, you know, will all those numbers be exactly the same a year from now? Maybe not. Uh, as, as more people get involved, as there's more people staking, as, you know, the system matures, all the constants will most likely have to do to adjust as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, the so only thing constant is change. So yeah, right, right. And so what I, what I think Arthur was getting to here is that the underlying algorithms that power the constants are now in place. Right. And so right. we won't, uh, a, if, if you had to rip out one of those algorithms and put a totally different type of algorithm in place, you might risk a hard fork on the network from an engineering perspective. Arthur's right. perspective, at least reading between the lines from his last video, is that we're, we're, we've crossed that chasm. And we're now to a point where the risk of engineering having to roll things back to a hard fork situation is, is, is being minimized. And almost all of the additional engineering work that needs to be done is additive to, to the core release of what can become the main net. And so I think in, uh, we're approaching a point where we can move out of hardcore development, we're finishing things, we need to move into uh, the stress testing on the network now. We have to do penetration testing uh, and we have to have third party audit of the code done before um, we can we can get the main net live. And I think that's really the main effort that needs to happen over the next you know weeks or months before, um, before the dev team's gonna feel comfortable. Now, do we have a, is there a time perspective on hardening to the network and that's, or is it just varies from project to project? Yeah, I, I, I don't know the details on the time frame of that other than I could imagine, um, given that we're an OCaml shop here, um, you know, we'll have to have uh, experts, independent experts in OCaml go through the code and, and do a code review. Uh, an audit of things, um, you know, that's uh, the, the good news is that the the core devs uh, in Paris are working with the top of camel teams already. So I suspect that they will know who that is and they'll be able to put that in place. Um, but uh, I, I don't think it happens overnight. I'm sure it's no, a sure, high yeah. process. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Just seen a lot yeah. of comments on Reddit. Um, sorry. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Sorry about that. Well, I was just saying on the on the code audit, you know, these things you don't want to rush. And uh, for, for this type of thing, it could literally take you know, possibly up to a couple months for code audit. It could be less, it could be more, but it's not something that you just uh, bring a team in, three days later, they're done. Right. You want this to be a comprehensive uh, check of all the code because, you know, as we know, any sort of uh, uh, hacks or, or issues with any uh, blockchains have happened because there's been, you know, slight glitches in the code that have allowed that is undesirable. Yeah, no. And so to get the system hardened, uh, audited, and checked uh, thoroughly before launch is well worth the time, even if it means, you know, taking a little bit of time and people have to wait to get their tokens. Yeah, I agree. I better, totally to have a, better to have a secure network. Yeah, I totally agree. We see what happens when uh, blockchains la launch, you know, impartial half-ass or just without checking the code. I mean, and uh, and hardening the network, you know, you lose, you can lose followers, you can lose investors, you can lose a lot of traction. And so- Yeah, you lose trust. Yep, yeah, that's true. And, and we got to we got to remember, right? This is a this is a third generation blockchain, right? This is not this is not a project that's being built on top of Ethereum. Uh, that that that's just an additive code base to Ethereum that needs to be audited. This is from the ground up, you know, new a new language, a new set of technologies, uh, and a new underlying set of protocols. So it's a big project. It's always always been a big project. Yeah. Um, it's a big project with a lot of attention. And for those out there who are, who are, you know, hating on not having, uh, having their coins, this is this next step of getting things audited and, uh, and fixing <laughs> any, any, uh, any penetration issues. This need, this is something you really want to have done correctly before, before the net goes live. Mm -hmm. no true. true, true, true. Um, I would like to, I would like to comment just on, uh, uh, the beta net. So could we have a could I know Arthur had mentioned a, a beta net with real parameters where you can have real transactions and things like that. Does that does the beta net come? Can that come before a complete hardening of the network? I mean, nobody wants to lose their tokens, right? Can, a bug can yeah. still like you can still have a buggy bug in, in the beta. Totally. I, I, I think it. Go ahead, Mike. 
Well, I was just saying that uh, there's obviously a certain amount of hardening that has to happen even for, for BetaNet when you start launching you know, real tokens. But it's, it's very common for new platforms to launch in stages to where you have just the base uh, uh, functionality that gets launched, the ability to trade tokens, the ability uh, to, to have a wallet, uh, and then you slowly add layers on top of that uh, in time. That's a great thing about, about really, really any third generation, especially Tezos uh, blockchain, is that it's modular. So it's designed specifically to roll out with you know, fewer features and then have another feature added, another feature added a few months later. Uh, features tweaked, all the modules get slid in and out in time. So uh, will the will it have to be hardened for the beta? Yeah, of course. Of course it will. Yeah. But will it be as hardened as it will be for a year from now? No, because that's the whole purpose. It's supposed to evolve, grow, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and get more complex. And, and all that complexity will therefore need to be hardened as well uh, on each uh, iteration. Yep. I think at the, uh, the Bitcoin meetup that Arthur spoke at in Switzerland last month, um, I, I think he mentioned the possibility of the beta net. And one of the one of the points that he he made was that it would be important for the core engineers to hold, you know, to hold a hard fork card at that point in time. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that if things in the beta net go terribly awry before all the code is audited, before um, all the security implementations are put in place, they can rewind things back and reset things. So and they, have, um, uh, they have that card for a year after launch, correct? Uh, at least, uh, I think that I mean, is, at least. It was, I thought it was at least two or they have yeah, the veto yeah, card is, is, yeah, is on, yeah, yeah. on protocol updates. They have the veto card. Mm -hmm. that, and, and that's a slightly different issue, right? Um, what, what I was talking about is that just the, the, the underlying, uh, concept that if we do put, if they do put a beta net out there mm -hmm. and the tokens do go live on the beta net, you're going to have to opt in to taking your tokens. And when you opt in, right, right, right. you're going to have to acknowledge that uh, things could change and could change radically. And maybe you, uh, you, you may not actually want to trade your tokens in the beta net environment because oh, right. in some unfortunate event where things get rolled back, that could that could mess up the the ledger, and you would have a hard fork that your tokens are stranded on over here somewhere else. So, um, so I think that's what Arthur was indicating with there. Now, what you're saying, uh, Jovi, is that um, you know uh, after the mainnet launch, the foundation uh, has a, a veto card on on chain protocol um, improvements over some one or two year period. I don't remember right, what, it, right, right. what it is, which is, which is an interesting, interesting play as, as well, given all the fin foundation shenanigans. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think in theory, you want that veto to happen just because they're going to be rolling out so many updates uh, in the next you know year, two years that you don't want every single one to go to a vote. Uh, you, yeah. They have a roadmap of, of updates. So it, it, it would be chaos in the first few, few months if, if, we all had to vote on every single protocol update, knowing how many there's going to be out there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, once, yeah, it's it, a, once it's fully stable and all the features are, are pretty much launched, and then we start getting third-party updates, people who actually write code for like some sort of a bounty, those are the ones that, that we're all going to be voting on and uh, trying to see if, if we can implement those. And then probably by that time, the, the foundation will no longer be vetoing you know, right, right, those totally. things. Totally. I think, uh, you know, a couple of points. One is it's going to be really amazing when we start having third party bounties for pull requests uh, onto the onto the chain, onto the protocol. I mean, can you imagine when we have a uh, million dollar bounty out there for some code that's been written and that pull request goes through and uh, we have new new <clears throat> some brand new major functionality released on the chain yeah. by a core group of developers and it all was done through you know a bounty and a DAO type of program rather than um, somebody trying to do an ICO on top of on top of Tezos. It's going to be really a game changer type of functionality. Yeah, that's oh. really cool. Wow. Yeah, the other the other uh, the other point I want to make about the future opportunity for Tezos is uh, as as I've made as I've made it known on Reddit and and, and on Twitter, I've had <coughs> the <oppor> <coughs> excuse me, I've had the opportunity to talk with Diego a bit um, uh, as he, as he was visiting us out here in California, and <coughs> and you know the work that he is doing behind the scenes on uh, on interfacing and interacting with research institutions and. Uh, and, and, and core scientific groups that have really advanced research going on in the blockchain space is, is pretty interesting. So 
once the foundation gets itself unstuck and once funding is available to fund more advanced uh, capabilities, um, and because there is such a large endowment available there, I think I think we're going to see investments being made over a very long time horizon for very new and powerful technologies that are going to roll into the the Tezos ecosystem over the next decade, uh, and and uh, we're going to have <clears throat> some of the best and brightest minds in computer science globally. Um, working on building uh, building the, the, those things out from a scientific and engineering perspective on a very uh, very long time scale that's going to be pretty interesting for longevity of the chain. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have I get questions all the time from folks who are new to uh, blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies, and they always confuse the two a little bit. You know, um, whereas you know cryptocurrencies can be used to, you know, just buy services and goods and they run on top of a blockchain, but the blockchain, blockchain technology can be used for much more. And so what do you guys, like, what are some cool use cases that, um, that, that you guys think will be, uh, will be sought on Tezos? So like we see Propy on Ethereum. Well, I think that's an awesome idea. Propy, freaking great. Um, one, sure? one of my favorite, I mean, I think one of my favorite uh, use cases is uh, fractional ownership of, uh, of assets, right? You know, when before, if you bought a house, if you bought a classic car or a expensive piece of artwork, you owned 100% of it. Maybe you had a friend who who you split the cost with. Uh, with with blockchain, you can you can split the ownership into a thousand pieces and basically turn it into a mini stock market for your house, for your painting, for your uh, classic car. So you can sell, you know, shares of of uh, pieces of of, of uh, assets. And then people can trade those those shares back and forth. So you get a lot more uh, liquidity in, in a fluid marketplace of assets. So I think that we're going to see a massive change in just how we even perceive assets and the ownership of assets. You know, you could hypothetically only own, you know, you could buy a house, you could, you know, split off shares of it, own 51% of the house, still live there, right. and fund, you know, a small business with the uh, the the amount that you raised. And it's not even considered a loan because you actually sold, you know, part of it. And because you have blockchain, you have complete uh, governance track you know, or complete provenance tracking of all the shares, all the transactions, everything. Yeah. Uh, and I think I think it's going to be a complete <clears throat> game changer for for all, uh, you know, types of assets. Mm -hmm. You know, no, it's yeah, very totally, cool. Yeah. One of the uh, along those lines, one of the cool things that happens around here in Palo Alto is I look out my uh, my kitchen window out on out on Loma Verde uh, Avenue, and I'm always seeing self driving cars drive by. Like really? there are there are 15 different self driving car projects within three miles of of where I live here, um, from the big guys like uh, the Google Waymo project and Ford and GM and everybody uh, down to Stanford and, and a bunch of other folks. And one of the one of the major things that's coming, you know, from an asset ownership perspective is what's going to happen in the automotive space, mm -hmm. right? People are, as self-driving cars and self-driving car fleets emerge, people are going to be less and less likely to, to buy a car and keep it parked in their driveway, right? Instead, they're, traditionally people today think, well, we're, we're all going to subscribe to some kind of Uber or Lyft program and have you know a self-driving car available to us to come pick us up whenever whenever we need throw the blockchain into that as you're saying mike and we don't we can take out the rent seeker we can take out the middleman right. that is uber right and instead uh bands of people can come together for very low overhead um own many many assets like that shared amongst themselves with uh, an off-chain organizational system that that tracks you know, usage and optimizes things. And at the end of the day, besides your, you know, the money that you've put into the blockchain for buying into that group, it's, you just got to pay a little bit for electricity and you're off and running for your vehicles. Yeah. Boom. Yeah, yeah. We're going to see some pretty exciting innovations in the next, you know, 18 months to 10 years. A lot of the assumptions that we have on, on how we get around the types of businesses that are out there is, is everything's going to change uh, a mindset because of some sort of implementation of blockchain technology. It's not necessarily just going to be cryptocurrency. Right. Yeah, that's right. just what people think yeah. because it's, it's very uh, flashy. But the underlying technology I mean, the, the, will change how we think of everyday life. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, the, and the reason why, why Tezos is so important in this discussion is because of that third generation nature and the fact that we are talking about a platform that's purpose built for high value smart contracts. Right, right. Um, it, Ethereum, you know, led the way here, but uh, but you know, it, it's it's fairly old technology that uh, wasn't spec'd out or engineered 
um, with with this particular kind of use case in mind, right? And so uh, you got at the end of the day, the most important blockchains are either going to be the stores of wealth or they're going to be the ones that provide the, the the smart contract capabilities. And and I think we have an opportunity to be the real real driver here. No, yeah, I, I totally agree. As a matter of fact, is this the position paper? Yeah, here we go. L. M. Goodman. Who do you guys think that is? The author of the white papers. Well, uh, kind of inside yeah. joke, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so he, uh, I think it's Arthur, to be honest with you. Yeah. Well, that's what I think. Um, let's see. Where does it say this? Okay. Yeah. Tezos truly aims to be the last cryptocurrency. Yeah. Well, it's because of its its ability to be updated. I th I think the reality is that that we're going to find that there will. There will never be just one currency. Right. You're, you're going to have, uh, you know, different platforms that mature. And I think if you could define what would be a, a fourth generation, it's going to be a third generation that knows how to talk to the other third generations. Mm, you see right, what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that just like, you know, the, the dollar didn't take over the world, the yen didn't take over the world, you know, you're not going to have one platform that's ever going to completely take over. Um, hey, hey, and I, I think. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. But I think I think that you're going to have you know a, a, a few that are doing really great things, and then sooner or later they're going to have to start talking to each other a little bit. Yep. And if you can get that to happen, which I think that Tezos has that ability in the future yeah, it does. It does. to upgrade and actually start interacting with other cryptocurrencies and other blockchains, then you're going to see the next exponential leap beyond what we're uh, seeing with uh, with this one. So that's that my personal correct. opinion. That's my personal take. Yeah, no, that is correct. That is actually that's in. I'm not sure if it's in the position paper or the technical paper, but yes, Tezos has is going to have the ability to communicate with other blockchains, and to and, and to function with them in the future and things like that. So that's really so, cool. I, I'm 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 really looking forward to to seeing how well all the ecosystems start to integrate with each other. But I think that's going to happen. I, I don't think that's going to happen for a while. I think that there's still a lot of maturity that needs to happen with each individual blockchain. There there needs to be a lot more. Uh, valid use cases. Right now, people are kind of scrambling, trying to figure out, well, we have this cool technology, but what do we actually do with it? There's a lot of hypotheticals, but pretty fast, we're starting to see real use cases. Yeah, and yeah. once that gets mature, then those use cases will start, start talking to each other. And well, that's what things are really going to get uh, exciting. The, de the decentralized application on top of Ethereum, Propy, just made their first sale not too long ago in the Ukraine. So it was a gentleman who um, used the Propy platform to purchase a home. And yeah. uh, according to some other news articles, they're even communicating with the governments of Vermont and California to work out to work out the details on how, you know, people can use the plat appropriate platform in those areas to buy homes using cryptocurrency. As a matter of fact, the Green Bay, one of the Green Bay Packers um, party houses that's close to the stadium, it's like a ranch style house, right? It's like a middle class neighborhood house but it's expensive and it's valuable because of who parties there and how close it is to the stadium and they're selling okay. an appropriate platform for bitcoin like a million dollars in bitcoin so that wow. like that's awesome so so we, we see it happening it's happening now, yeah you know what i mean yeah i mean you know there's just locally there's uh uh an italian company that's also based uh partially in seattle uh called uh look lateral and they they do high value artwork uh, on a blockchain and so it, it is happening. You are seeing real use case scenarios of blockchain that is going to impact our lives. Mm -hmm. So it's very cool. Yep, 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 yep. Awesome, guys. Um, well, we're we're almost forty five minutes into this here. I don't think really? people want to hear us talk. <laughs> people people want to hear us talk too much more uh, uh, today. But this has been fun uh, chatting with you guys, and uh, we should make this uh, a regular occurrence here until yep. there's actual real news that we can talk about. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> so does anybody have any last comments they want to make? Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll get to the wrap up here. Yeah, let, uh, let's uh, can we touch on delegation real quick? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so Mike, uh, Mike's uh, mycryptodelegate.com. Um, you you want to explain to the folks how this is going to work? They don't want to be a baker in the network. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they want to grow their stake. Yeah, well, I mean, everybody everybody who owns Tezos has the the right to to bake uh, on their own. And uh, there's a lot of really great explanations on uh, the, the Reddit page, GitHub, and GitLab. And it's, it's really relatively self-explanatory on, on how to do it. Uh, but a lot of people just simply don't want to. A lot of people are not technical. They want to do their daily lives, but they still want to benefit from growing their, their Tezos stake. And so they can delegate to a 
a delegate who does it professionally. So there's me, uh, there, you know, my crypto delegate, that's me, there's Tezigator, uh, there's gonna be other ones that pop up that uh, are gonna do a good job of taking your delegation and making your Tezos for you and then sharing in the profits. Uh, and, but one thing that people just need to remember is that just because there are delegate companies like mine, you can do it yourself. Every, everyone can bake yeah. their own bread or you can go to a baker and buy the bread. And that's the yeah. great thing about this platform is that it's either uh, easily self-served or easily delegated. And yeah. so it, what will happen is that you'll just simply type in the delegation code or copy paste into your Tezos wallet, hit the button saying delegate, and it'll automatically happen through the blockchain that the the person who is the, the delegate like me would find out and then we would you know, pay you uh, as the uh, Tezos start to bake and start to grow, essentially. Cool. And so I guess each delegation service is going to come up with their own reward bonuses for the. Um, how do how do how, how do we uh, how do we define those who who choose a delegate again, Mike? Those who choose a delegate. You, oh, like a, a like I'm a, a delegate tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So so if you are a stakeholder, you own Tezos. Therefore, you own a stake. You are a delegator of your stake to a delegate. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, the delegate, but you can be your own delegate, so you can delegate to yourself. True. So it, it is a little bit confusing, but it'll all be fairly self-explanatory once uh, the system launches. And we're planning on putting together some uh, instructional you know, information, so it should be pretty easy. We need to find out the information ourselves first, and right, then we'll exactly. and then we'll educate people. Yeah, so we've um, <clears throat> we've we've. Uh, we've spun up a uh, a riot uh, group of folks who are planning on running delegation services, so they can um, start coordinating from an information sharing perspective and and so forth and so on. If anyone out there uh, is <coughs> is making a <coughs> uh, making a significant investment, has the technical chops to be building delegation services, <coughs> reach out to, to to myself or or to Mike, and we'll uh, we'll get you into that. Yeah, I most I, I most definitely need to. I want I would like to go ahead and try to run my own node as well. Um, like I said in the past, I figured out how to uh, communicate with different block blockchains and build wallets and cold wallet cold wallets by just watching YouTube videos of people who have uploaded the instructions. And so mm -hmm. a physical a visual of it really helps those who aren't as technically savvy, right? But it's not rocket science neither. And so if something like that happens, I'm I'm good to go. Yeah. Or maybe Mike can show me or. Yeah, no, just, just give me a call. I'll, I'll show you. And then maybe you can make a video for your YouTube and, and educate the world. There we go. Boom, baby. Boom. Tezos is coming. Tezos. But you have to have your uh, music in the background. You have to have the Tezos uh, soundtrack playing in the background while you set up your node. 3.0. 3, 3. 3.0. You know it's coming. Yeah, it'll be there. Very good. All right. So the Bard has got his uh, his Tezos soundtrack. Also, if y'all haven't listened to that, we'll link it up here in the, uh, in the video. Uh, yeah. And... Um, Let's uh, let's give it a wrap. Thanks, guys, for uh, for coming on board here today. Been a lot of fun, and uh, we will uh, endeavor to do this again real soon. And maybe we'll bring some new guests in. So, if anybody has suggestions for guests that should join us here on our Tezos Today chat, we'd be we'd love to wire them in. Talk to y'all later. Fantastic. Have a great one. See you guys later.